Welcome to the Oil and Gas High Performance Computing Conference today. Today we'll be doing an overview of some of the innovative projects that are going on at Rice University and outside of Rice. I am Angela Wilkins, the Executive Director of the Ken Kennedy Institute. Today we'll be having an amazing line of talks about talking about the Carbon Hub, Rice Center for Engineering Leadership, Rice Data Science, uh, Rice Data to Knowledge Lab, and the ION. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please write your questions in the Q&A and we'll handle uh, questions after each speaker. Today, we first will. Uh, we'll, to first, I'd like to introduce today Marie Natalie Cantuau Carrer. Marie is the interim interim director, executive director of the Rice University Carbon Hub and research advisor for the Industry Partners Office of Research. As a research advisor, Marie combines business experience and in-depth knowledge of Rice to map corporations' interests and needs to the Rice research portfolio and establish collaborative research programs. The Carbon Hub, a research initiative launched by Rice in 2019, aims to accelerate the energy transition to the reliable and sustainable generation of green energy through the responsible use of hydrocarbons as a feed, feedstock for the ubiquitous carbon materials. I want to thank Marie for being here today. And sorry, I think I butchered your name. I practiced, I promise. It's totally fine. Thank you. So uh, can I go ahead? Just make it sure. Okay, so I will share my screen. Please scream if you don't see my screen. Nicely though. Okay, and here. Where is my application? No, I don't know. Okay, as always, it worked a few minutes ago, so let me find this. Okay, here we are. All right. Okay, everybody can see my screen, thumbs up. Okay, cool, thank you. So good morning, thank you for the introduction for this opportunity to present the Carbon Hub. So I am the interim executive director for the Carbon Hub, which is led by Professor Pasquale at Rice University. The Carbon Hub is building a zero emission world by advancing clean hydrogen and carbon materials that can slash CO2 emissions from industry and transport. So, Currently, the world is facing this dual energy challenge. How to meet the ever-increasing energy demand while limiting CO2 emissions to meet the target set by the Paris Agreement? And this dual, this sustainability challenge is a little bit like a whack-a-mole problem. Here I am, I hit the problem on the head, I think I have a solution, but I may have created more problems because the issues are all interconnected. I'll give you a couple of examples. Hydrogen is looking like a, a very promising clean burning energy source. However, there are no natural sources of hydrogen. So there is a, a color expanding palette that denotes the different pathways to produce hydrogen, each of them with the pros and cons. So gray and blue hydrogen generate a waste stream of CO2 and there is no financial incentive to actually uh, store the CO2. Green hydrogen, is extremely energy intensive and you recover only a very small fraction of the energy you have to put into the process. A turquoise hydrogen generates a waste stream of solid carbon. At the same time, the primary offenders for CO2 emissions are industry and transport, which represent 43 and 25 percent respectively of the global CO2 emissions. And the industrial sector is the hardest of all to abate because making metals and cement requires a lot of energy from fossil fuels to reach the temperatures you need. And it includes chemical reactions that will make CO2 as a byproduct. When it comes to the transportation sector, one of the tactics is to improve the energy efficiency of the transportation fleet by maybe replacing metals with light, lighter materials such as aluminum and carbon fibers and by electrifying the car so they become smarter. But when you introduce aluminum and carbon fiber, you're actually introducing metals that have a very bad CO2 and energy footprint. And when you add more cables to electrify the car, you're actually increasing the weight. So maybe your energy efficiency is not going up as much. So is it a catch-22 solution? Can we do something? So the Carbon Hub is about going beyond turquoise hydrogen to what we call azure hydrogen. So like in turquoise hydrogen, take your hydrocarbons, split them, into hydrogen and solid carbon. And the splitting process does not generate CO2 emissions because you don't introduce oxygen. And also the energy that you need for this splitting uh, process could be renewable and it's a small fraction of the energy you recover as hydrogen. 
But if you start from methane, for every ton of hydrogen you make, you get three tons of solid carbon. And you get even more solid carbon if you start from other hydrocarbons. So the novelty here is, let's focus on the solid carbon. Let's do something about it. Why? Because hydrogen is a commodity, but carbon, solid carbon is a specialty. So the question, a specialty product. So the question now is, what do you do with the solid carbon? Well, let's be smart about it. Let's make the right form of carbon to eliminate the CO2 emissions that I was talking about from industry and transport. Obviously to get there, you need to have the right process efficiency, the right cost and the right policies in place. So where are we going to put this carbon? When you look at the current market for carbon materials, it's very small compared to what the potential supply could be for carbon materials. Because on one hand, you would get 5.5 gigatons a year of carbon. And if you start from methane, you would get 22 million tons of solid carbon for each quad of hydrogen that you make. And the demand for hydrogen is growing up and it's about to explode if you look at a recent McKinsey report. However, on the other hand, the current market for carbon materials is at the most 15 million tons a year. So we're really very different scales in terms of, of, of uh, tons. Why is it so small? Well, all these carbon materials, the ones that are out there right now, they lack structural, structural integrity. So there is only so much you can do with them. They are still expensive and they do have uh, an energy footprint and a CO2 footprint that would still generate CO2 emissions. So where can we go then? So in this graph, I'm showing the production of several um, materials in the world. I'm trying to get to my little pointer. I don't know if you see, oh, no. Um, so what you see is that, so this graph is taken from a book by Ashby in 2013 with data from 2007. So it's a little bit data in terms of data, but it just has gone up. We have added two blue points on the left to represent oil and natural gas. And what we see is that all these materials that are used at this very large scale, they all have something in common. They have structural integrity. So then the question is, what can you be displacing? You could go after cement, concrete, asphalt, but they are very cheap. It's five cents per kilogram and they use these static applications. Whereas if you look at the metals, they come at much higher prices, 80 cents to $7 per kilogram, and they are using transportation. And also remember those CO2 uh, emissions offenders that we talked about before, when they are here, cement, steel, and primary metals are those primary offenders. So the right form of carbon could displace these emissions from industrial materials. And uh, so how big is this problem for the material energy nexus? So in this graph, I'm showing the amount of energy you need to mine, process, and refine metals in the world for primary steel, aluminum, and copper. And what you see is that it represents 12% of the world energy. So we always talk about the water energy nexus, but when you look at the amount of energy you need in that nexus versus the, one you, the amount of energy you need for the metals, you see that actually metals are creating a much bigger problem. When you look at the CO2 emissions, the metals represent almost four gigatons per year of CO2 emissions. The blue wedge represents the CO2 emissions associated with water. So again, metals are, have really bad CO2 footprint. So a couple of years ago in his blog, Bill Gates has asked, if somebody tells you they have a solution for climate change, ask them, what is your plan for steel? So what we say is like, replace steel with carbon materials. So why can it happen now? 30 years ago, that was not possible. But in the last two decades, research and technological developments have unlocked pathways to new forms of solid carbon, such as, car oops, sorry, <laughs> such as carbon nanotube and graphene. And these solid, car so solid forms of carbon, particularly carbon nanotubes, have properties and attributes that overlap with those of metals in terms of strength, thermoelectrical conductivity, stiffness, and flexibility also, if, depending on the application you have in mind. And you can put them in usable shapes, such as fibers, tapes, cables. So now we have a range of solid carbon materials that can be used in a diverse uh, range of applications from wiring, panels, uh, beams for cars and buildings to soil amendment for farming. And each of these markets 
or present tens of millions of tons each year, which is what you need if you want to match the scale of the energy systems. And I just wanted to show, this is a little harder maybe, but this is already happening. This, the fiber I have in my hands is entirely made out of uh, carbon coming from methane. I can bend it, I can stretch it, I'm pulling on it, and it's, it has electrical conductivity, thermal conductivity. So these things are not just a dream in a the lab, they are happening. So obviously to accelerate uh, increasing the process efficiency, taking the cost down and creating this uh, new supply chain, chains, cross-sector collaborations are required. And that's why in 2019, Rice University established a carbon hub to bring together academia, industry and federal labs. And it was launched with a $10 million commitment by Shell and additional funding by Prismian, which is a cable manufacturer, and Mitsubishi Corporation Americas. And we're about to announce two additional corporate partners very soon. Um, we also established a very large research ecosystem with over 80 research organizations, 80 researchers, sorry, over 20 different research organizations across the world, in the United States, Spain, the UK, France, Italy, and we're expanding to South Korea. And last year, we awarded $1.3 million for sponsor research and the anticipated budget for this year is over $2 million. So in order to enable this bull transformation in how we use hydrocarbons, the Carbon Hub is comprehensively articulating and integrating four key areas. So the Piazza is a community building arm where the scientific and engineering community can come together. The Scuola is educational workforce development arm. The Foro is a policy development arm where we want to ensure that policy, technology, and society needs and perceptions, they all remain in sync. And the Bottega is a research arm. So the goals of the Carbon Hub that aims at advancing uh, reliable, sustainable, and affordable clean energy while slashing the CO2 emissions from industry and transport are aligned with several of the sustainable development goals by the United Nations, because it's about producing clean hydrogen without any CO2 emissions from hydrocarbons, displacing materials that have a very bad CO2 and energy footprint with uh, carbon materials, so decarbonizing the manufacturing and construction sector in that process, and also improving the energy efficiency of transportation because we're introducing lighter weight carbon materials that have a better footprint. So I want to leave you with one of the projects that uh, one of our collaborators is working on. We're funding some of the testing involved in this project by Mark Gurthrop at MIT. He's receiving significant funding from the Department of Energy to work on this. And the idea is to build a house entirely made out of carbon materials. So this is how we're creating this zero emission future. So will you join us in making this possible? Thank you. Hi, Marie, thank you so much for that. Um, so when you say come join us, how, how can people be part of this effort? So when we say join us, thank you for the question. So first of all, we're building this ecosystem uh, for the supply chain. So where uh, we want to partner with people along the whole potential supply chain from the energy companies to the producers of semi-finished products to the end users of carbon materials. So if you work in that sector, that would be very interesting talking to you and see how we can work together, particularly companies that make those value added solid carbon. Then if you are a researcher, an academic researcher, we're always looking for more expertise. We want to make sure we have all the experts around the table. So please come talk to us. If you're a community member, you're curious to understand how this is going to work out because typically the lexicon is let's get rid of carbon. No, let's get rid of CO2. So it's not an either or. We can work with hydrocarbons to make this zero emission future possible. We want to talk to you and explain to you why this is important. Um, everyone, please remember, you, you, there's a Q&A there if anybody has questions, but I, I, I definitely have more. Um, why is uh, now the right time for something like Carbon Hub? So until a few years ago, it would have been crazy to think that hydrocarbons could be used as a feedstock for materials. They were used uh, to make uh, carbon black, but on a very small scale. So now we're saying, no, no, 
e carbide feedstock at these massive scales that are similar to the energy system scales. Well, we can do it now because hydrocarbons are not considered scarce anymore. You have all other forms of energy sources coming online. Then there is also this increased pressure from stakeholders, governments, society, financial institutions to really think as a systems approach, you have to take into account the life cycle emissions of all your products. It's becoming increasingly evident that we have to work together to solve this CO2 emissions problem. So the pressure is there. Finally, in terms of performance of these materials, until recently, these materials were like in labs, in startups only, but now we have very good performance. We do have to improve properties for some applications, but the properties we currently have are good enough to displace metals in a lot of applications. Like what I have in my hands, this is real. This, you know, it's hard to see with the virtual background, but this is already happening. So because of all these reasons, it's the right time, but what we are missing is a coordination. How do we coordinate this whole effort to really accelerate the establishment and deployment of the sustainable pathways from hydrocarbons to clean burning hydrogen and solid carbon materials? A uh, question from the audience. What kind of short-term goals does the Carbon Hub have in the next three to five years? So our first goal is to have a small scale plant that would be 3000 tons per year. That's the important first step because currently carbon materials do improve the intrinsic, proper, the intrinsic properties of some key applications such as wearables, advanced energy storage, high-end uh, uh, consumer products such appliances and, uh, and in aerospace. So the, there are markets where it can penetrate and that's what we need to do. We need to build a small scale plan because once we have that, we can start learning how to improve the process efficiency and take the cost down and we establish a reliable source for these carbon materials and one that is economically sound. So that's the first step and that will happen. We are working to make that happen, yes. Well, thank you, Marie. I, I think uh, we'll move to the next talk. Uh, again, thank you so much for being here. Virtually. <laughs> yes, happy to be here. Thank you again, Angela, for the opportunity. Next, I'd like to introduce Fred Higgs. So if he'll turn on his video. Hi, Fred. Fred is the Vice Provost for the Academic Affairs, Director of the Rice Center for Engineering and Leadership, and the John and Ann Dower Professor of Mechanical Engineering. Our cell's mission is to inspire, educate, and develop ethical leaders in technology who will excel in research, industry, non-engineering career paths, or entrepreneurship. Our cell's programming enhances a traditional engineering education by providing skills not typically covered in the, an engineering curriculum. Through a series of curricular and co-curricular learning experience, our cell students learn to create, communicate a vision, build a high-performing team, uh, execute collaborative plans and create innovations that endure. Fred, thank you for being here today. I look forward to hearing about your new programs. Fred, you're muted. You may still be muted. Oh no. Looks like we have technical difficulties. I think we might need a second to figure them out. Just, uh, oh, I hear your voice. Yes. So again, um, so thank you for being here. I'm excited about the of future of Houston and the role that Rice uh, wants to take in catapulting uh, all of us ahead. Uh, and so again, I am uh, Fred Higgs and I am a mechanical engineering professor who leads the Rice Center for Engineering Leadership. And uh, we're excited about uh, the future as far as 
um, how we can help uh, certain individuals rise into leadership and become technology uh, leaders and to take your organizations there as well. So again, we are uh, a center at Rice and we're focused on getting technology professionals and engineers uh, to get training in, in leadership and that goes across the entire academic spectrum. Uh, so our, our goal is to create leaders in technology and engineering. And I, I did want to kind of holistically uh, explore this in the sense that uh, you all are all professionals who are here, uh, but because our program spanned the gamut, uh, we want you to be aware of this uh, for perhaps your, uh, your children at one stage and all the way up to uh, where you are um, there. And so the way we uh, look at this is in three ways. Um, what we're doing with undergraduate engineering leadership, uh, what we're doing with pre-college uh, initiatives to create a pipeline of future engineering leaders like yourselves, uh, and then what we're doing with graduate and uh, postgraduate. And so we look at this and, and uh, we have a certificate program here at Rice University for engineering students who want to uh, have uh, an education in uh, rising into leadership and management uh, pretty early in their careers. And so we have a certificate and it's uh, and basically they focus uh, on some fundamental principles and then they go into a specific career a direction, uh, which we say the acronym RIPE, I'll talk about it a little later, but it's research industry, um, non-engineering pathways and entrepreneurship. Uh, and then from that core center of training our, our, our undergraduate students, uh, we, we then go out to the pre-college um, engineering audience. And then finally, uh, out in the community with uh, bringing you in for master's degrees um, or even non-degree uh, training opportunities. So as far as what we're doing for undergraduate engineering leadership, the way we look at this is that a student comes in and, uh, and you know, the average student uh, like me, um, when I came in, you know, you just kind of navigating your career path uh, blindly uh, there. And, uh, you know, the, the black lines here of this maze are the ethical boundaries. And so you come in blindly and, you know, you're not really sure which direction you're going with your career. You may end up at a dead end or not. Uh, of course, uh, we have the, uh, the the person who might come in and, uh, you know, they're working in the career paths and they may uh, kind of get outside of some ethical boundaries uh, to get ahead, to make it towards leadership. Um, but the RSL student, we're training them to be ethical leaders in, uh, in technology and engineering. And through mentorship, we have a lot of, we brought in a lot of former vice presidents from Fortune uh, 500 companies who are working now. They retired and now they're working in our cell uh, training. Uh, they do some of our training to, uh, to our extended uh, graduate and non-graduate uh, programs there. And so we just have a, a whole slew. We probably have the most professors in the practice at Rice University, which are former uh, executives from industry who come back to Rice um, to impart their knowledge and, and work right alongside the uh, field experts uh, uh, within engineering. Uh, there. And so they're helping to navigate our students. We have a curriculum that we hope they navigate these way, uh, this, this matrix and efficiently uh, get into leadership position uh, because we think that's a good thing for the world. And so fundamentally getting this engineering leadership uh, certificate uh, for uh, college students who are majoring in engineering, they, they'll take uh, what we call kind of the engineering leadership 101, some fundamental courses, and then they must, at the end of their certificate, select a career track and either uh, this right direction here. Uh, so just for the undergraduate, uh, for the fundamental uh, part of it, they learn communications, a rapid decision-making, of course, ethics is incorporated across everything we do, project management. We have it at the undergraduate level. We also have a certificate program on Coursera. I'll talk about a little later. Um, for you all who are professionals, um, we want you to analyze yourself, uh, do an assessment, and then uh, move yourself forward. So that's the self-leadership category. Um, before you become uh, a leader and, and exert good leadership, you need to understand followership. And so we hit the teamwork uh, uh, part hard. Uh, we, we give them the tenets of being a visionary and what and we kind of case study what visionaries look like so we can begin to help these students mature and cast their technolo technological understanding in a visionary point of view. And then finally, once they finish that kind of uh, fundamental training, they must choose a career path, RIPE, um, here under the acronym RIPE. 
And so we think of it like you come in, you know, a little unripe as a banana. And by the time you leave, we want to catapult you into uh, industry uh, there. And so, or whatever career path you choose. So the first career path for ripe might be a research career like me. I was an undergrad engineering major. And then I went on into, a, you know, to graduate school, uh, got my doctorate and then uh, went into a career path that was obviously in academia, uh, becoming a subject matter expert uh, and conducting research. Then there's of course the I is for industry, like most of you. Uh, these students will come out and we and we aim them towards what they need to do to rise into leadership uh, in industry, as opposed to rising in the leadership like this young person who can become president of a university. This young person become uh, maybe uh, a, a CEO or C IO, I should say, uh, or CTO. Now this one here is interesting. We're recognizing uh, the, the pathways. Is, this is a, for non-engineering pathways. So we recognize that engineering is the number one way to get into business school, law school, medical school. Um, and, and so we, the, we bring in a bunch of experts. This class is taught by a patent lawyer with two degrees in engineering who went on to law school. And we bring in career professionals who are engineers that went to do non-engineering things using their analytical objective minds to go into these other career paths there. And, uh, and then finally, entrepreneurship, which uh, some of you um, who, are, who are looking to be attached to the ION and other startup initiatives in Houston, uh, there we're training our undergrads for that. So you can come and scoop them up for internships uh, and things like that. Now, I want to uh, shift gears a bit here as far as what we do with high school programs. I wouldn't normally mention this. But I'm talking to the Houston community. So we want you to know for your uh, children, we have some pre-college things also uh, looking to create uh, leadership experiences uh, um, and STEM enrichment activities to create the next generation of engineers. So we have the Elite Tech, Emerging Leaders in uh, Technology and Engineering program. Uh, we pivoted last summer uh, to be online. It was a day camp on campus because of COVID. We pivoted online. This summer, Rice just decided we'll, that you can come on campus, but we've elected to stay virtual again this summer. But this is, this is uh, great because we're still quite hands-on. So there's several tech courses your student can take. These are half-day camps because you know, we don't want them sitting in, the computer, in front of the computer all day. So they can choose a tech course, and they also are getting leadership experience each week. So if they come in week one for AI and machine learning, we'll literally teach them machine learning coding and how to develop their own uh, products with that. Uh, but then they'll be doing one of the leadership sequences for that week. And they can come back for another week and do that. So it is a, it's a fee-based camp and it's, and it's called Elite Tech. And we typically never have more than five to seven students per instructor. So, um, so it's great. This is not a look at the uh, students who are the high schoolers. These are our live instructors. So uh, our brilliant Rice PhDs, undergrads, master students will be your live instructors for this. I did want to get to now uh, what we're doing. This is a new program that's being planned. It's a Masters of Engineering Management and Leadership, which we think pertains to a lot of, of you all uh, there. And so um, uh, we're, we're very near approval um, for this new master's degree. We think it's going to be transformative for uh, uh, Texas and beyond uh, there. And so this is a Masters of Engineering Management and Leadership, and it's going to be an on-campus degree uh, and an online degree. We're excited about that. And so uh, just kind of looking at that, um, you can think of an organization, right? You have the CEO at the top, uh, a, a board uh, that really governs uh, him or her. Uh, and then you have several, uh, or, or several particular directorates, like the, the, uh, the COO's operations director, information security, business development, you know, different directors. And then there's normally an engineering or technology uh, directorate. Uh, rising to the top of that is what we're aiming to. So these are for, uh, we expect our alum, we call it the MEMO program, Master's of Engineering Management Leadership, under the acronym MEMO. So when I say MEMO, like Jimmy Kimmel, you'll know I'm talking about this master's program. Uh, but uh, we want our alum to, 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 these are for the ones that want to lead engineering, not leave engineering and say get an MBA or something. And so we're going to give them this training to move right up that uh, ladder or, or within the engineering division there to be a CTO or be vice president of engineering or, or other leadership roles. So if you think of this, 
like the end of, you come in here, let's say a software engineer, he comes in uh, here or she comes in and then she would uh, go to a senior software engineer. This is the individual contributor part though. But then at a certain point, as you know, at companies, you could go up the leadership direction, uh, engineering management uh, ladder, or you can stay on the individual contributor ladder, which ends at something like senior fellow. And normally uh, these fellows we're bringing back to Rice as uh, professors in the practice and things like that. But on this side, if you want to go up management, senior manager, director to, to the vice president level and maybe to CTO, this is what the memo program is targeted at catapulting you and doing. Uh, so we're looking for you to push up, the memo degree pushes you up that ladder there. Normally you get like a normal master's and PhD, you're going up the individual contributor a ladder. But if you take a product and you think of it over time, uh, it's uh, technological performance is increasing. We call this innovation. The slope of this line is the pace of innovation there. And so we're, we're producing, we, if you graduate from a program, we, we want you to think that you're someone who can lead and manage a team of engineers uh, to create these kind of ethical, technical uh, product solutions that helps society on there. And the whole curriculum is slated to be able uh, uh, to do that. And for you to actually consider the next generation of products where you consider user data and bringing that back in. So if you're an alum in this program, uh, then we expect that you're, you're a little different, right? You're not just an, uh, an MBA uh, with an undergrad degree because some of your courses will be, 40% uh, of your courses will be uh, highly technical from uh, actual engineering departments. But you'll, you'll be able to connect the internal knobs of a technology uh, and then relate that to the economic outcome. But you're still close to the internal technical knobs. So knowing how the, the product works and being able to describe that because you have this advanced engineering training. Um, certainly, you, you should be a more structured thinker who could know the, the fundamental tenets of a technology and how that relates to the overall design of that. Uh, you'll be able to leverage your deep technical knowledge to understand things. And you won't just be a binary thinker, right? Um, someone who may be not an engineer, not a memo uh, alum, uh, who actually goes into management. They're more like a give me your opinions and just take a go and no go perspective. We, won't, we don't want you to be so binary, but being more nuanced. Like, this is why we need this. This team is your most valuable team. This person is your most valuable person. We need to put uh, protection around this person not ever leaving the company. So being very nuanced in, in understanding those different things. That's what this program is about. So we have several courses here um, and uh, there's seven engineering management leadership courses, three within a discipline. So if you're a mechanical engineer, you might want to take three all in mechanical on there or maybe want to take three in, uh, in data science. We have that as well, industrial engineering, financial engineering. Um, but you have seven engineering management courses. So we'd say it's a breadth sequence of leadership, get a depth sequence in a particular engineering topic, and we think you'll come out quite strong with that. Lastly, I'll leave you with our certificate programs, which are non-degree. You're like, I don't want to yet jump, uh, I want to put one toe in the bathwater, uh, not jump to the full master's degree. We have, we're on Coursera, we're the, uh, we're their leading and on, uh, we're their only engineering management uh, curriculum there. You can get a certificate in engineering leadership. Um, we're one of their um, leading uh, offerings there. And we have this, this is online, of course, Coursera, but we also have a new program that's on campus and so you have more information about that. So we're the Rice Center for Engineering Leadership. Um, here's our website. There's my email if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Fred, for that. I really appreciate your program because I working on a, I worked a lot of time in the startup entrepreneur scene, and I know one of the great challenges we have here is basically having talent that is trained in leadership. We have wonderful technical people here, but this program just seems, you know, it, it just meant for, you know, our growing entrepreneur scene. Um, from your point of view, uh, I mean, I'd like to hear what you think about that, how you think about that. Yes, that, that's, a, that's a great point. Yeah, we do see ourselves, you know, one of our frameworks is that, uh, you know, when Amazon, as you know, uh, came here and they didn't choose Houston um, as a place they felt they could build their uh, headquarters to. And, and we think that we're a, a part of, of changing that mindset 
um, there. So we want to, you know, you have these talented individuals. Texas is second in terms of concentration of, of engineers per unit area. We're second behind uh, Silicon Valley. And so there's just this, this great mindful of that. And these are great engineers. A lot of them are certainly in oil and gas and, uh, and, we, and we, but we, but a lot of them want to pivot elsewhere. We want to give them that engineering management uh, training to go on and do a startup, to go on and, and lead uh, the technology sides of, of a division at a technology corporation. And we want to be right there in the, uh, the ION as well, uh, working alongside these uh, professionals there. So we, we're definitely looking to think that uh, uh, you get the right leaders in place and they will definitely, uh, they have, they have a, a, corp, uh, a corpse of, of engineers here in the region and they'll be able to do great things there but we do need those leaders in place. And so this is why that program is dedicated to those. And we have top v, former VPs who are coming in and teaching this right alongside the uh, experts uh, like me in different engineering areas. How does, like if there's somebody who wants to be involved, that, you know, a, a top VP um, who would like to participate as a mentor, how do they, should they email you or? Yes, they, they definitely should. Um, We'll soon be uh, looking for uh, faculty members with different trainings in different areas from, you know, uh, engineering management and leadership to engineering project management to uh, product uh, design. You know, this is, this is really around the product, right? The technology. One of the mm -hmm. things that we're looking at is doing this industry 4.0 perspective. The program is built around that. The next generation of products are things where the streams of data can come back uh, to you. So you can learn about your product in the field and improve that design. Um, over time. And so we, we, we're agreeing these thinkers who are thinking about these next generation uh, products as well. I have contracts I'm working on with the oil and gas industry. Think about a, a, a drill bit that's giving you back data so you can improve that design for the next drill bit uh, that actually uh, comes in. We're looking to create professionals who think um, in that way. And so whether you're in industry, you want to come back, uh, definitely contact me or you're looking to get into um, our programs will we'll be eager for that. Uh, Johnson & Johnson recently brought us in um, uh, there and we, we did just a custom uh, version of the engineering management leadership training uh, just for some of their employees uh, um, as well. So we, we do that also as a non-degree option. Leaders, a leader brought us in for that. So that's to the VPs as well. Well, thank you so much for uh, participating today and sharing what you do every day and uh, uh, I'll see you again in soon. <laughs> Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce Ginevra Allen. Ginevra is the Associate Professor of, Elect of Electrical Engineering, but also Statistics and Computer Science at Rice University. She is also an investigator at the Jan Dan Duncan NRI Institute at Texas Children's Hospital and also associated with Baylor College of Medicine. But most importantly, she is the founder and faculty director of the a wonderful program called the Rice Center for Transforming Data to Knowledge, informally oft, often called the D2K Lab. At the D2K Labs, uh, the D2K Lab provides students with engagement, enrichment, and experimental learning opportunities by connecting students with the real world data science challenges from companies, community organizations, and researchers. And I thank you very much for being here today. I think. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me. Um, can everybody see my screen? Good. Excellent. Yes. Okay. Well, thanks very much for having me. I'm excited to tell you a little bit about the D2K Lab at Rice. Our goal is to make an impact through data science in our community. Um, so first, uh, we are in an age where there's lots of data and data everywhere. This is especially true in the oil and gas industry and energy industries as there's a digital re revolution and new data sources are coming, whether it is in from seismic or from telemetry data, putting sensors on lots of large scale equipment and monitoring them to many more aspects of the industry. So there's data everywhere. And the challenge in talking to a lot of people from companies and other areas is not necessarily computing with this data. I think there's been great strides recently in computational power for storing and analyzing this data, 
but it really comes down to people, people that have the skill set to transform this vast mountain of data into usable knowledge and actions. And at Rice University, our goal is, of course, to train this next generation of people or data scientists, as we call them, to help understand and draw insights from really big data. So in 2018, we launched the Center for Transforming Data to Knowledge. Informally, we call this the D2K Lab at Rice. And I should point out, this is our little hist algram. For those of you that are rice folks, you know that we're the owls, and uh, this is our little hist algram. But we are a center focused on uh, data science education and helping and empowering our students to make an impact using their data science skills in the community around them. So we're focused on innovative data science education, experiential learning, or learning by doing data science. And this is critically important because in data science domains, we can't expect students to learn just by taking technical or theoretical classes. They really need to get their hands dirty on big, messy, complex data sets. And so what better way to get students these opportunities in data science than by partnering with the people who have these real data science challenges and these really big and messy data sets. That's what the D2K Lab is all about. So particularly, we try to connect our awesome Rice students at the undergraduate and graduate levels to people that are suffering from a data deluge, basically who have lots of data and have data science challenges and want solutions. Um, so we actually make those connections and partnerships to actually help uh, our partners, whether they're companies, community organizations, government agencies, or researchers, get data science solutions at the same time while educating the next generation of uh, Rice students who are going to become data scientists and hopefully engaged in some of the partnerships or engaging with some of the partners that we build. So what do we do in the D2K lab? So we offer a number of academic programs and courses, as well as other programs and events on campus focused on engaging students in data science. So all of our courses are part of an undergraduate data science minor that was launched in 2019. And I should mention and highlight, we have a new Masters of Data Science program that is launching in fall 2021. It's both an online uh, program and an in-person program. And this is in uh, collaboration with the computer science department. So we're very excited about this. And all of our courses are part of these programs. Some of the big courses we teach include a D2K capstone course. This is a, a capstone experience is an experience at the culmination of a student's educational career where they basically get to apply all of the great techniques that they've learned about throughout their coursework and they get to apply them to solve a real world problem. I'm actually gonna be talking about that um, a little bit more and particularly our partnerships with the energy industry when it comes to this capstone program. We also offer uh, an introduction to data science for students. Um, and this is a unique course in that we actually still have connect students with real world opportunities and data sets to show them the uh, opportunities in data science. And what's great about data science, of course, is that you can use these data science skills to tackle problems in so many domains. It's not just one domain. And we want students from freshman year onwards at Rice to understand the types of opportunities and challenges that they can tackle with data science. So this is a little bit about what we do with students. And of course, everything that we do, our courses and all our programs and events, we try to do these in partnership with the people who have and own those uh, real data sets and have those pressing data science challenges. So we certainly work with researchers from Rice and the Texas Medical Center, as well as clinicians at the Texas Medical Center. But we also form partnerships with government agencies and nonprofits who have data science challenges. And of course, also work with industry where there's a lot of data science um, challenges as well. 
So I want to expand a little bit on our D2K capstone program. So our capstone program is a really unique program. We have uh, teams of students, typically four to six students per team, work on a problem brought in by one of our outside partners. And what's really unique about this is they're working on a, on a problem that is, and they're working on the real data sets brought in by our partners. So our students are getting an opportunity not just to work with publicly available data or synthetic data or things like that. We want our students working on the real data sets that matter to our partners. So we uh, work with, say, companies to get sponsored research agreements to actually have our students work with those data sets. So something else that's unique is this is an interdisciplinary capstone program, meaning we don't just have students from one major or one degree program in this. We have students from across campus coming and bringing their unique skill sets to the table to help solve a pressing real world challenge. We also have undergrads through grad students um, uh, working together, and every team is mentored by a sponsor mentor and a faculty mentor. So this is a kind of a teamwork data science challenges and prototypes. Um, and I want to show you some of the examples of some things that our students have done in the D2K capstone. So, for example, we've done lots of partnerships by now. We've, we actually have, um, have worked on over 50 uh, sponsored, externally sponsored capstone projects in the D2K lab. Here's just a couple of highlighted projects that we've had. Um, I'm going to talk about some more projects in the energy industry, but we've had some great success working on projects with, uh, in collaboration with Texas Children's Hospital, looking at pediatric cardiac arrhythmias, and the team there built a new arrhythmia detection system and a new dashboard for clinicians to use, and they're actually continuing to develop that and move on and, and move on from that and uh, publish their work and also develop kind of clinically um, uh, applicable uh, dashboards that, that are actually going to be embedded in Texas Children's Hospital systems. So um, that's an example from, and this was a, a team of students at Rice that worked on this for about a year. We've also worked with the Houston Fire Department for several years on several um, major problems. We've worked with companies in finance and tech, but of course also in uh, oil and gas industry. And there's lots of uh, great projects and partnerships in oil and gas industry. I think um, everybody will, uh, that knows data science in this industry will probably agree with me that there's a lot of messy data science challenges that arise um, uh, from uh, these systems. And so we've had students work on things all the way from uh, anomaly detection and predictive maintenance to processing of telemetry data on big industrial systems in oil and gas to predicting kind of forecasting for um, energy kind of energy finance and energy fintech uh, sector to also doing natural language processing of, for example, well log reports, which are notoriously, uh, I'm, I'm told, of course, by our partners, notoriously challenging to decipher and get usable information from. So we've had uh, done a variety of projects across a variety of data science domains, and um, all of these projects are hopefully directly applicable to our partners and give them prototype solutions to some of the data science and machine learning challenges that they're encountering in their business. And um, just kind of an overview of, of the capstone program. Um, uh, at Rice, this is the requirements for an elective in nine different degree programs, including that data science minor and new master's in data science program that I mentioned. And a unique aspect of this program is our sponsored research agreements that allow companies to directly share their data sets with Rice University um, students and faculty mentors to help them solve data science challenges. So in our sponsored research agreements, of course, we have uh, paths to uh, make sure we ensure data security and confidentiality, but importantly, any intellectual property developed is assigned to the sponsor. So um, a lot of success from our capstone. Um, this is an example of one of the Houston Fire Department teams presented their findings to city council in Houston, and they particularly studied uh, the fleet 
allocation of vehicles in the across all the different fire stations in the Houston area and determined that six more ambulances were needed. And with a handful additional ambulances, the long tails of response times for situations and emergency calls in which vehicles couldn't get there quickly would decrease dramatically. And so these are some of the types of findings and types of um, problems that our students are solving. And there's um, our Rice students are really creative and innovative and come up with really great solutions um, to these. And it's a great way to partner with organizations as well. So we do all sorts of other um, events and programs and for industry partners, there's great ways to engage with Rice students, whether you're interested in prototyping a data science solution in our capstone program or engaging with our fa fantastic students for recruiting. And uh, every year we have the Rice Datathon. This past year, it was fully virtual, but we still had over 330 participants in a virtual Datathon and over 9,000 in prizes. Um, it, was a, it was a really great event. Um, it's a great way to engage with students. We have a data science career mixer, an industry insight seminar series, and many other things um, that are great ways to directly engage with Rice students um, in data science. So you might be wondering how to get involved um, if you're interested uh, in, in working with the D2K Lab, learning more about the D2K Lab. So we have an affiliate program for uh, our industry and community partners and offer lots of networking and recruiting events with students, of course, and branding, but also opportunities to sponsor Hack Rice and the Rice Datathon, um, which are weekend long competitions for students as well as capstone teams, social impact teams, and of course, connections to the Rice data science, data science ecosystem with lots of events in, uh, in data science around Rice. And um, please do uh, feel free to contact us if you have any questions or check out our webpage. Thank you so much, Geneva, for that. I, you, I think you covered this somewhat in your talk, but I want to highlight this because I know this is probably a question people ask a lot. How is data protected and what measures are taken to ensure confidentiality? Yes, that is a great question. So we have two mechanisms in our sponsored research agreements to make sure we protect data. We know that data is very valuable and, uh, and, and everybody of course takes this very seriously. So the two mechanisms are as follows. If you have confidential data and data that is you know, very important, we don't want this to ever get out. We don't want, these are our students. We don't want them to ever mishandle the data. We actually have a sponsored research agreement that lets to keep your data on your secure systems and simply give Rice students and their faculty mentor virtual private access to that um, system. So basically I tell everybody, it's like if you hired an intern in the time of COVID where you have to give students, you know, that you or your interns virtual access um, to your data, but it's of course protected and on your systems and you can put systems in place that don't allow the students to download any information. So this is what we do with, uh, with when we work with companies or, uh, or clinicians say that have HIPAA protected data, which is really important. So the second system is uh, if, if, our, if someone says, okay, well, we, the data is important, but it's not super confidential, we can transfer it to RICE and the students then work with the data on RICE systems, but we only recommend this for you know, less important or confidential data. So we do have sponsored research agreements for both and are happy to work with companies on how to set up a system that would be best for them and their data sets. Along with training data scientists, I think you probably often get asked, okay, I'm already graduated, I'm already in industry. I want to pursue this area. What do you recommend? So um, for those people that are in industry, there's um, a couple of options. I'm going to first mention again that Rice has this new master's in data science program. We have an online version that you can actually do in the evenings and still uh, work full time. We're also in the process of launching a graduate certificate program in data science. So for example, you can take four courses out of the master's in data science program and get a graduate certificate to upskill in data science and learn these new skills. 
I should mention also a quick preview that the D2K Lab is in the process of launching a short course for professionals based in part on our capstone program and our capstone curriculum that we've developed teaching these types of skill sets to professionals as well. Um, part of this is in partnership with some things that are going on at the ION related to the next talk as well. Um, of course, none of this has been announced officially. I'm just giving you a quick sneak peek. Yeah, I, I, I knew a little bit. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here. I'm uh, really excited to see the impact your programs have over the next couple of years because I, I, they're pretty important. And I think you knew that. But uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Next, we have Jan, my predecessor. <laughs> I would finally, I'd like to introduce Jan Odegaard. Jan is the interim executive director of the ION. The ION is an innovation hub in the urban core of Midtown that connects the central downtown business district and the Texas Medical Center, which anchors Houston's technology and innovation ecosystem through partnerships and programming that creates pathways and opportunities for inclusive and resilient economic growth. But uh, uh, Jan also used to be the executive director of the Ken Kennedy Institute, so I will feel forever bonded with him. And I, I really appreciate everything he's done to help me catch up on, on this job. And I will let him take it from here. Thank you, Angela. And, and this is a hard crowd to follow because there's so much exciting things going on. And, and in my current position, of course, I see a pathway to where I'm currently working at the ION. And, and, I, and I, I, you know, I, I thank you, uh, Genera, for setting that up. And I, you know, I was thinking, like, well, we need to get some of these exciting sort of action learning projects sort of to the corporate. So looking forward to continuing that conversation. But uh, let me kind of give a high overview over not just the ION, but also a little bit of the district and how that is sort of connected and how that is going to be a unique resource for, for the innovations and the programs, both the, you know, if you think about the Carbon Hub, but what they're doing ultimately plugging into industry. If you think about what uh, Fred talked about, our cell and sort of leadership and whatnot, how that plugs in and the D2K sort of the journey. And I, I envision project coming out of D2K where the students want to, well, this is a startup. I'm going to go somewhere and actually launch this, you know, where they can work out the IP around that. And that, not to forget that one of the most efficient way of doing tech transfer out of academia, and I think this has been proven out many places, and I think we, we have some lessons to learn, is really through allowing startups to have access to intellectual property and to drive that. And that's all ultimately lead to larger licensing agreements with the corporate, which are less sort of a forward leaning in sort of taking, taking that initial. But, but so why the ION innovation, why the innovation district and the ION, it really, is, is sort of a twofold from Rice, you know, Rice's perspective, you know, Rice Management Company uh, that is funded and, and sort of capitalizing product, uh, the project really focused on, on two things. It's, uh, you know, it's financial returns for the university, which is supporting and sustaining the, the, the great programs that we have just heard about, you know, on campus, but it's also supporting the growth and diversity of the regional economy. And these are critical things for us. And, and part of Rice's, uh, you know, 2020 vision or the, the vision or the, the vision for the second century the version two is really to in deepen our engagement as a university and institution with Houston because Rice is in and of Houston. And, and as that, you know, the future of Houston is really aligning tightly with the future of Rice University. So it's very selfish on, on, on RMC in some part to really make this investment to activate and accelerate sort of Houston in tech and innovation. So let me see if I can forward the slide. Uh, can't do this without the critical uh, partners as we've seen in many of those uh, talks earlier. I do wanna you know, to, to take just a, a second to, to show you the, the great partners we have. You know, BakerBot, Chevron and Microsoft was really well aligned and really see where we are driving and, and wanna be part of that journey of transforming Houston. Also affiliate partners of Intel, Inspirity and Merce Drilling. And then not to forget all the community partners that already have engaged and reached out to us to build the programming that I'll talk a little bit of as we move forward that truly makes the eye on the building and ultimately the district a very 
different sort of real estate product that really sort of amplifies what it means to be in a building that actually deliver not just an office for your corporate or your startup, but actually deliver programming that actually activates you. And, and that sort of resonates with, with a, you know, Chevron and Microsoft, as many of you may have heard, has also going to be tenants in the building. And we're working on a range of other tenants that are going to be uh, in the building as we move towards opening. So where is the innovation district located? And, and you know, and, and location does matter. And, you know, it is halfway on a stretch between uh, the central business district downtown and, and the medical center. Uh, you see it here with the red dot. You know, if you take a three mile radius uh, circle around it, you actually embed most of the academic institutions in Houston, uh, you know, that have their, their home campuses. And then our academic network actually includes all of the ones, the 10 that you see here, and we're constantly being approached by academic institutions from College Station, you know, from halfway to College Station to Beaumont to, to Clara Galveston, you know, wanting to join and be part of this ecosystem that drives towards the future of, of Houston, uh, you know. So, uh, you know, just another view of that, you know, I just want to remind everybody that, um, uh, you know, automobile free convenience does matter to, uh, to increasingly to, to our younger generations. Being on the light rail there, the, the big yellow blob is the innovation district and the ION being a part of that. We are on the metro rail, we're close to the museums district, downtown business district, the medical center. And for this particular U, you see also where Rice University is, you know. So, so this is super important for the retention of talent to know that this is something the high density proximity and convenience, you know, I'm not expecting to spend uh, hours on the freeways commuting every week, you know, I can actually live, work and play, you know, and a highly overused phrase, but something that I think is important uh, to, to, to the younger generation and increasingly also to the older generation where, wherever I belong. So, um, so what is, what about the ION? What is the ION? Uh, I mentioned it's a different real estate product and it's different because uh, it is the old shares building that we see in the bottom left corner here reimagined as an innovation hub. And if anybody on this call are interested in maybe getting a peek at it before we open it, you know, reach out to me uh, separately and we may be able to arrange that. But, um, but it is sort of a uh, close to a 300,000 square foot building that actually has a lot of event and programming space, classrooms, work, workspaces, office spaces, you know, to support meetups and, you know, food and beverage will be in the building, you know, we'll run a lot of community building events, accelerator programs, startup services, you know, a range of programming that actually is something we do on the lower level on the main floor, supporting the four floors about it and all the tenants that's gonna be in the building. These are the programming that truly make this a different office building. If you go to any office building downtown and you walk in the door, what is the one thing you find? You find the desk with a halfway sleeping security guard uh, at it that can direct you to the elevator or to the restrooms, but you're usually heading to the elevator, going to your floor, and you're hiding there for the rest of the day until you leave and go back to the garage. This is a different building where when you get into the building, you're there immersed in all the activities and programming that we are creating. And as we're building an, a, a, a richer and richer program, including with our university partners, that's what you collide with and engage with as you enter the building. You see the forum stairs here, uh, which is an amphitheater where you can do TED Talks, conferences, workshops that can have 250 plus people. You see restaurants, you know, you see the outside plaza here in front of the building that truly actually is meant to be, it's a multi-use sort of people engaging infrastructure and, and, and public parks uh, and plazas that really is sort of pervasive through the district longer term. Uh, and here you see another view, and now we're talking about, so where is the ion within the district? So the district is 16 acres of land in and around that old Sears building in Midtown. Uh, the long-term uh, you know, objective is to build three to five million square feet of, of public open spaces, mixed use development, you know, have a very active public realm, you know, and community focused ground floors, you know. The idea is that 
the bottom floor or two will always be accessible from the plazas and, and the green spaces and where people are engaging. So we want people to truly engage with this and be part of this district and, and not just be coming to it because they have an office on the floor. This is a different destination that we're trying to create here in Midtown and we're really excited about what the ION is creating, which is the first building, truly setting the standard for the future development in the district. Uh, there will be a parking garage somewhere in the district, but it's not going to be on a per building side. We want to put that aside and say, leave your car here and now participate in the, in the entire district and in, in its entirety. So, you know, what are, so what is the objectives and goals for the overall district and the eye on itself? You know, it's really focused on, on, on four key things, you know, at the very high level. It's strengthening Houston and Harris County's economic resiliency and competitiveness, you know. And this was a little bit of the Amazon HQ2 that we heard earlier. It's like, why, why was it that we didn't win, uh, you know, at least landing on the top 20 list uh, of, of that uh, consideration? Well, you know, we had some challenges and I think this, the city and Rice stepped up to sort of address that. You know, the second part there is attract and retain innovative talent, you know, companies and institutions. We already seen some of that, you know, HPE announcing that it, it chose to, to move to its headquarters to Houston. We have seen other uh, smaller companies being here. Bill.com Bill created its uh, second big uh, locations in Houston a, a year, a couple of years back. You know, so this is really an important part of growing our economy and accelerating Houston as a destination. I keep using Houston as a destination. I think that if you were in the energy industry, Houston was always a destination. If you needed to have, you know, uh, a, a, you know, have a cancer treatment, Houston was a destination. If you needed to go to JSC, Houston was a destination. But beyond that, it wasn't seen as a destination for tech and innovation. And I think that's actually changed dramatically. And it's partially an image problem because we have an incredible ecosystem of startups and, and growing startups in, in, the, in the city foster an inclusive and welcoming neighborhood that offers economic opportunity for all Houstonians. Houstonian, uh, Houston is the seventh most diverse city in the, in, the na in the nation, and we're the fourth largest city in the US. You know, we need to capitalize on that and we need to create those opportunities and be very purposeful and inclusive as we think about how we activate you know, uh, tech and innovation and create those opportunities that actually lifts uh, you know, uh, all, all participants in, in Houston. And then we wanted it to be a vibrant, connected, and timeless place that truly transforms the, 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 the create a future of where offices and collaborations happen in a different way. You know, more specifically, Donna, sort of the workforce and, and, and uh, peace, diversifying the tech workforce, diversifying tech entrepreneurship, and strengthening community businesses is a key part of that. We have a rich you know, uh, uh, rich assets here to tap into and enable. And this is an important part of what we're doing. Uh, I just want to show you this quick video here, uh, you know, that gives it, so let me see, it should play now. Right in the heart of the four mile long innovation corridor, stretching from downtown Houston to the world's largest medical district, the Texas Medical Center, is the site of a transformational project that will serve as a nucleus for Houston's fast growing diverse and inclusive innovation ecosystem. In early 2019, Rice University announced the development of a 16-acre innovation district that will encompass more than 5 million square feet of creative office, multifamily residential, retail, restaurant, hotel, and public park space open to all Houstonians. The district is anchored by the renovation of a historic Sears building into a 300,000 square foot collaboration hub known as the ION. Over 100 million will be invested by Rice University into the ION to catalyze a district that will set a new standard of urbanism, connectivity, and inclusivity in Houston. Set to open in early 2021, the ION is a collaboration space designed to inspire people to accelerate innovative and tech-forward solutions for the challenges facing the world. Rice University's goal is to increase collisions between the region's entrepreneurial, corporate, and academic communities. The ION will support businesses at all stages of the innovation lifecycle and provide resources for Houstonians seeking to participate in the innovation economy. Academic and corporate partners will be immersed in a robust and diverse environment of accelerators, workforce development programming, 
cross-university collaborations, and resources for entrepreneurs. We are building our innovation ecosystem, one entrepreneur at a time. And the ION in Houston's Innovation District are just one exciting part of this community-wide effort. You know, so now we see the, the building is mostly completed and, you know, we're super excited. And, uh, you know, hadn't it been for COVID, we probably would have been actually, I would have been at the building delivering this uh, talk. Uh, this is a view of the building uh, from the Wheeler and Main Street location. Uh, and I'm super excited about where we are. Here's a few renderings of the plaza that's being uh, finalized. And we're looking forward to have all of you participate and engage and be, be using this plaza. And, and engaging the restaurants that are already announced to be in the building. So what is the, the vision and mission? We see our vision really to accelerate innovation and connecting communities, but, but really what, that does, what does that mean? It, you know, it means so much because for entrepreneurs and startups, that means we're supporting their journeys. You know, for the corporate innovators, we're supporting their, them colliding and engaging with the, the ecosystem, both from the point of view of uh, the, the entrepreneurs as well as the academic and the community. And, and so there's a tremendous amount of, of, of uh, you know, bad content in that particular phrase there. Connecting communities, again, we want to be for all Houstonians. And, you know, and, and ultimately, the ION will anchor and activate this whole district you know, through the various partnerships and pathways that we're creating to create opportunities to advance and sustain resilient economic growth in Houston. So these are our four stakeholder communities as I think about them when we think of who are we serving? Who are the ION serving? Startups and entrepreneurs, front and center, part of our original DNA. Corporate innovators. We are a building with corporate uh, office spaces like Chevron and Microsoft and others that will be signing there. They are actually plugging in because of what we're bringing there. You know. And the ION academic networks, which many of you are part of, and we're looking forward to activating and collaborating with. And then there's the community and workforce piece that is beyond what the academic institutions are doing. But what the ION programming that we're developing are doing is really bringing these stakeholders together and creating that connectivity between them, you know, amplifying the collisions, connections, collaborations. And then we add to that the investor community that really brings capital to those startups and those, uh, those growth opportunities that, that our startups need to do. So it's really about accelerating this piece of the, of the pie and creating whether it's a talent pipeline, whether it's a startup and, and intellectual property transfer and so on and so forth to create that vibrant destination which Houston gets to be known for. Uh, this is the larger district. Uh, the green uh, circle here is the ION, a parking garage with also a public realm will be added here. You see all the plazas and the green space that's going to be added to it to kind of make that, uh, uh, you know, a holistic view. Looking a little bit more densely at it, if you look at all the activities that already we are already putting together inside the ION and, and related, you know, this is super exciting. You know, I'm, I'm not going to read out this. I'll be happy to share the slides. We can send them out to everybody that participates, you know, but it does have a rich environment of accelerators, you know, what we call gateway project, which really is the light touch engagement. Come and discover what is in here for you that, that could be the value that you need to derive, you know, and then we expect to have a lot of corporate tenants, as I said. Other thing to keep in town is that adjacent to us, Greentown Labs, which many of you may have heard of, which is the clean tech accelerator out of uh, Boston, also established in Salvi, the second location. And they're actually looking to open in, the, in that particular building, G1 there, sort of in, in, in late, uh, you know, mid to late uh, Q1, uh, Q2, sorry, uh, of this year. So we're really seeing the district starting to take shape. And then there's other buildings that will come online over the next several years to create that three to five million square foot of space. Here are some of the Marquette programming at the ION. I'm not gonna read through this list, but it spans the spectrum from community engagement, what we call gateway series, you know, perfecting your pitch, e-commerce, how to start a startup, you know, again, to activate the community, you know, uh, we have a, a monthly recurring uh, Houston startup showcase for anybody in Houston. You don't have to be part of ION to take your company and want to come and pitch it. You know, we're, we're launching an angel investing series uh, that we want to run out of the ION. Uh, we have our accelerator hub. Uh, we have been run, we're just closed uh, and we'll be uh, launching the Smart and Resilient Cities Accelerator. 
Rice Alliance will run its clean energy accelerator out of the ION. Div Inc. of Houston will come to and uh, will uh, be housed at the ION and will also run its accelerator there. And then we have also a partnership with Vision Galveston that really brings the larger Houston Galveston region together. Um, we also have an, an, uh, an aerospace innovation hub that includes an accelerator. A lot of startups, you know, 40 to 50 startups will be in the building, kind of building their come, uh, you know, business plans, their uh, pitch decks and their pitches moving forward and developing their technology. Um, and so, you know, and then we're, as I said, the academic network, we're working on several th things here that's going to really activate, you know, we have a big idea series that's going to be a sort of a weekend program, you know, where we, where we draw sort of uh, all the academic programs, you know, the, the various, uh, you know, as more of a poster session where we do mixers and engagement, and maybe there's a hackathon of sorts as part of that too. And then we have another series, how things work that actually also we are launching. And then we're looking to the academic partners to see what they want to launch. You know, uh, Ginevra alluded to some very exciting discussions. Stay tuned for that. A lot more will come around uh, that fairly soon. And I'm not going to go down here and, and, and talk about the rest of it. You know, we, we're going to have a prototyping lab, about a 6,500 square foot prototyping lab on the premises, you know, where, you know, entrepreneurs, corporates can come and say, I have this idea, I want to create X, you know, well, but I don't know, I don't have the CAD expertise, I don't have the electronics expertise, you know, are there consultants that can help me actually create my first prototype, you know, and maybe even manufacturing it on site or send it off to have it manufactured. So we really want to have a flexible, for those on, at RISE, this is basically, a, you know, a, a similar to what ODEC is uh, to, to engineering students at RISE but at the ION, accessible there on the very first floor. We're gonna have an investor studio. One of the key things is to make sure that where do investors go when they come to Houston? We want them to come to the ION and meet sort of deal flow, if you will, and engage with, with the community to talk to, you know, get pitches, do advising and do that engagement, you know, come and run classes out of the, of the building and so on and so forth. And then, that's what I have to share. Uh, it, it, you know, I, I look forward to welcoming you to the ION. Uh, Timeline-wise, as I said, we'll be able to move in uh, in, a, in a couple, you know, in about three weeks or so. Uh, COVID will determine whether we, whether that physically will happen. But then moving from there, the building will gradually start opening, probably by mid-year, where we start piloting some limited in-person programming. And then, you know, as we move into the fall, we'll pivot most of our online programming then to in-person programming at the ION, you know, welcome you there, have a cup of coffee, maybe yeah, a beer or a wine uh, an evening. So look forward to talking to you. Hi, Jan, thank you for doing that. Um, I think like, well, you talk, I, I, the ION is a great opportunity because there's many, many, many things going on. I, I think, you know, uh, from your point of view, uh, what are some of the bigger hurdles when we talk about accelerating technology transfer? Because that easily aligns with a lot of these things. Well, I, mean, I think that's a it's, a, it's a very sort of thorny issue. And I think universities across the country are sort of looking at that and it's like, well, what does that look like from a university perspective? Uh, and, and I think one of the things is there is sort of like, well, you, you, you have processes by protecting IP and, and, and you know, doing that. And, you know, you can file for disclosures and you file for patents and all of that. But what happens after that is really important. And, uh, and you know, there are, you know, there are some success in licensing to corporate. But I do think that that's a, that's a little bit of something, you know, I'm, I'm have creating this nest egg of IP and I'm expecting to license it. I think that maybe taking approach where maybe de-risking happens through startups and they are creative about it. So creating very attractive ways for startup to take IP out of the university ecosystem and into a startup and then have them do the startup at the place where they collide with corporates, where corporates actually now is like, oh my goodness, that, oh, I never thought about using that IP that way. I could never, I would never have licensed it. But at that point, now it becomes a, maybe a meaningful licensing term. So by playing the, the 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 long game in doing tech transfer i really think you can start pivoting and starting to accelerate that ip that's often tied up and sort of almost you know locked away at the university 
And Rice is not unique. I think all universities are struggling with this. Some of locations are probably way more, you know, uh, you know, are, are ahead of us in terms of Rice University, but I think we can catch up quickly. And ION could be a place where those collisions with the startup that have the academic, you know, that they produce IP and, and could accelerate that. Yeah, I think the immediate feedback that ION will provide will be instrumental. Uh, now, I would like to bring up everybody for open discussion. We only have nine minutes, but I, I think we have a time for a question or two. Um, if, I also wanted to leave a few minutes. If anybody in the audience has a question, please feel free. I'll, I'll do my best to get it answered. Um, I, I think one of the things that stood out to me, it's like, you know, these were, you know, what we're talking about are some of the th four things that I'm most excited about. I was wanting to give it chance to, you know, the rest of you, like, are there things going on, not just in the rice ecosystem, but in the ecosystem that, you know, get, that you're excited about that you'd like to share? Uh, Jan, I see you first, I'll let you go first. Well, you know, all the things I heard about today and what I, you know, what I am seeing here in Houston excites me a lot. And then Angela, as, as I, I think I've told you, you know, as the transition happened, you know, I, I, I've spent a lot of time at Rice in the office that you will be occupying, and 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 I really love that. And, and you know, but it was time for me to take a look at what what is Houston and what can we do in Houston. You know, and I think you you know, and, and Houston often get sort of uh, you know underrepresented, or you know, I don't know what the right phrase is, but you know, we are, we are getting sort of not you know, Houston. Why why should I go to Houston? And then we that live here truly understand what Houston has to offer. And I think we, we have some, we have an image problem and we all know this, uh, but right now I'm really bullish on the fact that that's changing. And I think people are realizing that I need to take a second first look at why I should come to Houston and why Houston actually is a place in an ecosystem, you know. I mean, it's a tremendous amount of deal flow that's happening. Do we have unicorns, uh, you know, like Austin or uh, Bay Area? No, but that, that could actually be a, a function of the fact that the valuations in the Bay Area is just overinflated and the valuation here is not at the same level. So it's kind of an interesting thing. So we measure the ecosystem by unicorns and then a unicorn in Houston is probably way more successful than actually a unicorn in the Bay Area just because of the sheer valuation over the environment you're in. And by the same token, also Austin to some degree that's also getting that. I think there is a lot of things to offer here. And the fact that Houston is not trying to be something it, 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 it isn't in the, at this particular juncture, I think is super important because I've seen a few calls start in the past, you know, of Houston wanting to become more tech and innovation. And we've always been about, we, we can't be Houston. This time we're actually being Houston. Let's do the things that we are good at. Let's take the energy and pivot to energy 2.0, which is the new, uh, you know, sort of message from, you know, from the Greater Houston Partnership. And by the way, thank you, uh, Marie and the Carbon Hub. This is really on brand for what you're doing and Green Town yeah. Labs coming here. These are the exciting things to me. And we're becoming a destination in tech innovation. We will have investors coming in wanting to actually get those Houston type uh, unicorns because they want to have an early picking. Thank you, Jan. Ginevra, I would love to get your thoughts on some of the things that you see. Yeah, I think um, uh, there's a lot of opportunities. I wanted to mention um, something at Rice, uh, kind of uh, D2K's kind of sister organization slash we, we might be the younger child of this organization and that is OEDK or the Oshman Engineering Design Kitchen. Um, they uh, ten, uh, 10 years ago launched and had team-based learning for engineering prototype and really laid a lot of the groundwork. D2K kind of launched this kind of in data science and machine learning afterwards. And um, there's an opportunity to work together very closely on prototyping engineering solutions that also have machine learning and AI challenges and have interdisciplinary teams working together and really innovating in, uh, and there's a lot of opportunities to also connect with entrepreneurship programs there and actually have Rice students who are doing fantastic work, sometimes in collaboration with companies or our partners, actually form startup companies and, and work to kind of uh, uh, build their kind of product. And so that's what we're really looking towards. And we're excited about the interdisciplinary aspects of that uh, work as well. Thank you. 
Marie, I am sure you have some thoughts. I mean, with the, like, as Jan left off, the, all the things going on about Energy 2.0, uh, from your point of view, what do you see? Well, I think Energy 2.0 is happening right now. The goal of Houston is to become the uh, city of, you know, it's this world center for, it's the energy city for the world, but now it's going to be the energy transition city for the rest of the world. It is happening. And I think one thing I want to highlight at RISE is the Welch Institute, which is a partnership with the Welch Foundation uh, that is bringing, over, bringing $100 million over 10 years. And that's very important because it is again into this ecosystem, building materials with fundamental science and computational tools to get materials that have the right properties from the ground up. And this is about, again, uh, making Houston the capital of the world and spur innovation with, within the energy and other industries. So I think there is this collision of facts that's happening now, it's about to explode and it's super exciting to see how things are moving forward. Yeah, I hadn't even really thought, for, I've run about the Welsh Institute, but you're right, That's and that's gonna affect every single one of us in some way from, you know, training to new projects for the D2K and how it interacts with the ION. It'll be exciting to see that. I hope oh. hopefully we'll get the executive director for the Welsh Institute announced by the end of the semester. <laughs> uh, Fred, uh, what do you think about, what do you get excited about? Yes, uh, you know, certainly uh, I get excited about, uh, I mean, Houston is, is unique again. Uh, we have the most engineers uh, in terms of concentration other than uh, Silicon Valley. So just few cities can uh, boast on that. And a lot of them are wrapped in a certain industry. So, uh, you know, you wanna think of Rice uh, because we have a lot of programs, degree programs, non-degree programs to train you to broaden your skills beyond oil and gas in case you want to, to, to make a pivot. Um, uh, certainly catapulting the oil and gas industry forward uh, you can get uh, deeper advanced knowledge through our master's and PhD programs uh, there uh, to be more innovative, to take something like, you know, the next generation of energy uh, forward, like come to, to get some advanced training. And then, you know, just outright collaborations with Rice faculty. We have a tech transfer office, so you can definitely look to translate your technologies to industry. We can work with you on IP, such as, you know, Geneva has a very friendly IP arrangement if you come to her lab, but then faculty themselves uh, will generate IP and it's and it's ethical for them to first secure the IP. Some people think professors want to publish it and you want to patent it. That's not true. We take the research dollars to generate the knowledge. Uh, you guys take the knowledge to generate the, the dollars. And so, um, and we have an a office that's uh, there to work for that. We have specific centers like AMP, after Manufacturing Performance and Tribology Center, if you're into 3D printing, the Newt Center, the Welsh Institute, as they just mentioned, $100 million on advanced materials, and many other uh, different uh, centers here with faculty expertise to solve your problems. So we really want you to spend time just looking around at Rice to see how you can get your problem solved and, and the IP can be taken care of as well. Thank you. I think we have a hard stop in a minute because I'm sure everybody has 1130 meetings. We had one question from Gender and I'm going to let Jan finish everything out. Uh, I think, I, this is an interesting question. Can you speak about how the IM will collaborate internationally with global institutions and entrepreneurs? So, I mean, it, I saw the question and it's, it's an interesting question. And, and I think that uh, to the degree that uh, ION and Houston can be a destination where you know, our focus is really on activating and creating opportunities in Houston for Houstonians. You know, so, so we don't wanna, we would wanna create a pathway into Houston. So we wanna be a destination for that. So we're very careful about our engagement should we make sure, yeah, yeah, you're coming here to help us activate Houston for Houston. That could be through creating new jobs in Houston for your corporation and maybe international. It could be through partnerships like that. It could be through research and academic partnerships, but we really focused on ultimately delivering the value to Houston, you know, from that point of view. And, and that's important to us, you know, and so we would welcome those conversations and engage in, the, in, in that, uh, you know, conversation. Well, thank you everyone very much. This is the end of our workshop. Uh, and again, thank you for those attending and thank you guys for participating and we'll see you guys soon. Thank you everybody and have a good uh, rest of the uh, Friday and weekend. <laughs>